and welcome to Tell Me More. For this session, I'm joined here by Hom Le Wong from the USA, and we'll be discussing reosio integration in failed implant sites. Firstly, welcome and thank you for being with us here today. Uh, now, firstly, um, what factors contribute to the failure of osseo integration in dental implants? So, th there are many factors contributed to the uh, the osseo integration and also the, we call it periimplantitis, but the RCA integration can be caused by the periimplantitis, which is the infection, or can be caused by the trauma from occlusion, which is the too much force and cause the implant loose. And certainly that's the two major factors there. So when should you save and when should you remove an implant? For me, if I look at an implant, uh, I have a couple decision tree, which I follow. So. If the implant has lost more than 50% of bone in a single implant site, and in a younger patient, and also in the wrong position, or the difficult for patient to maintain and clean, uh, most likely in that situation, I will prefer to remove it. Now, in, on the contrary, in the implant, which is more like a circumferential defect, and with the bony wall support, and more in a critical area and in a multiple implants, which if I remove the implants, it's gonna to cause too much trauma. And also if a patient allow me to do a submerged heating, mm -hmm. because I believe it, I wanna get a 100% regeneration, I have to remove the prosthesis and to cover them, which back to the original st uh, stage. Then I will say in that situation, with the favorable of the regeneration defect, such as class 1B, and also uh, some of the uh, buccal dehiscence which, or infraosseous defect, I will do a regeneration instead of remove it. So what are the, cur the challenges that clinicians will encounter, the initial ones? I think the clinician will encounter for decision in taking it out or keeping it, it's always the patient's feeding mm. because patients always don't want you to remove. They worry about too much trauma. And sometimes trying to repair the failed implant, it creates even more trauma than just take it out and put a new implant and do the bone augmentation, then the new implant. So I think patient didn't understand that perspective because there's not enough data out there. Yeah. But I think by taking a failed implant out and graft it around the area and put a new implant, it's actually a more conservative and less traumatic approach than trying to re repair it. So how do you go about reassuring the patient uh, in their decision making? So for a patient to understand the treatment, you have to first assure the patient the, the, the evidence and the cases you've done before. So illustration, so the patient knows what process they have to go through. And certainly you also need to do the cost comparison because the patient may think it's going to cost more money to, to take the implant out, put a new implant in. But if you show them the cost is almost equal, I think that most people will say, maybe I should go with a more ideal implant position, the better prosthesis, and then just take it out and put a new one in. And um, what is the current and probably the most popular process that is used um, in uh, currently by clinicians in this situation? I think at this moment, it's still in a puzzle, in a cross war for many clinicians. They don't know which one to go. And I see so many people trying to save it, trying to do whatever they can to save it. And part of the challenge is the more you're trying to save it, the more bonus you end up. And so it's more difficult to try to even repair in the future. So people didn't understand that. That's why we need to have a more bone augmentation. It's because of failed implants, not because uh, the patient lost bone be to begin with, because we're trying to repair some things didn't work. And then the more you repair, the worse you get. So some, sometimes it's the reverse. <laughs> so maybe you can tell us about what your most recent insight is regarding the best practice in re osseointegration integration uh, in failed implant sites. The failed implant site, I put in a new implant in. Personally, I've been doing that for the last 30 years and many patients refer to me as a failed implant and I remove it and do a bone augmentation, put a new implant. Mm. So far, I have not seen any failure yet, or I'm not going to say any failure. I'm not seeing the major problems, and most of my patients was happy with the treatment and outcome. And my job is to correct other people's mistakes, which have been doing that for many years. And I, 
for example, I have one patient always uh, ask me a question. I have the implant done two times fail before. How can you guarantee you did it? It's going to make a difference. That's a very and so I did it and it works. So the patient say, "Wow, it's it's not not discomfort. It's not painful." So I say, "You know, you got to know the procedures and you got to find the the people who had experience, not just the people who." you know, on the street, and then you're gonna to try to see them to do a more advanced surgical procedure. This type of a surgical procedure requires skill and knowledge. So I think many clinicians need to get trained and get knowledge and skill before they do it and or attempt it. So what is your preferred medical procedure in the treatment of this? Personally, like I said, I will, if I have a more than 50% of bone loss, I will take it out and then yep. graft it and put a new implant. Maybe you could talk to me about the new biomaterials um, or techniques that are used in reconstruction to how do they influence outcomes? This is the question I actually uh, post for the audience. You know, we don't know what biomaterial is going to be impact on the treatment. But personally, right now, what I use is at least 50 percent of autogenous bone because I need the cells. Then I mix with other uh, bone graft materials such as allogenic or xenogenic. To me, uh, allogenic will be replaced by the body. Xenogenic can hold a space. They all have a unique properties. So once you mix together, you're gonna get a result that you want because you need a cell and you need a resorption and also you need a space holder. So I think by com combining it with a good decontamination, so implant in order to regenerate it, you have to remove the infection source. If you cannot do it, there's no chance it's going to be work. So what kind of time scale are we looking at exactly um, for achieving stable re integration in failed implant sites? And are there any factors that can accelerate or delay this process? Yes. Generally speaking, you know, I, I always joke around, I'm a Chinese, I like A, so I usually wait for eight months. And used to be, I always say nine months because the pregnancy, the baby needs nine months. But for me, I think minimal time for the healing is actually six to eight months. But if you're using a biological agent, uh, such as recombinant BMP2, and or some of the PDGF, uh, platelet derived growth factor, you may shorten the healing time but more research is still needed. People, because some people are saying using this type of the biological agent, you can shorten the waiting time by actually another one to two months. Homle, you um, host, presented uh, did a presentation here um, earlier on today. What are you hoping that the audience or the attendees are going away with after your presentation? You know, my job is always share the knowledge. And I think the key is the decision tree. When they look at the decision tree, they can ask themselves, should I follow this line and understand the etiology, understand if implant has a mobility or not, what kind of a bone loss after one year, and the type of bone loss, amount of a soft tissue components, because this is actually the thinking process. And I think if you can follow through that thinking process, you can get a result that you want. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for telling us more. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you.